Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, Albuquerque neighborhoods juggled with the decision whether or not to support a publicly funded downtown stadium for New Mexico United. We are already extremely special and we need to preserve all the things that make us special. Plus, the state's new redistricting process shifts from a citizens committee to state lawmakers. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. COVID-19 just won't stay out of the headlines, but it's the financial response to the pandemic that's causing concern at the Capitol. A New Mexican author has a unique approach to handling climate change. Our Laura Pascas talks with Bill DeBuiz about what he calls Earth Care and how it could shift the way we think about environmental action. But we begin with new developments in the state's brand new redistricting process. The Citizen Committee has now approved its list of proposed election maps for lawmakers to weigh in on later this year. And others are trying to take it all in and identify their favorites as well. Here's correspondent Gwyneth Dolan with more. My guests today are Mason Grant of the Black Voters Collaborative and Keegan King of the All Pueblo Council of Governors Redistricting Committee. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Gwyneth. Keegan, I want to start with you. Um, you know, the New Mexico's 19 Pueblos plus the Hickory Apache Nation agreed on the maps that you submitted to the committee. Um, but the Navajo Nation submitted some different plans. Um, and, and, you know, the Navajo Nation includes slightly more people. How are some of the plans different? How, did the, how, do, how are these different? Yeah, thanks, Gwyneth. Uh, you know, the plans from the Navajo Nation and from the Pueblos and Hickory Apache Nation are remarkably similar. Um, you know, both coalitions uh, put forth House and Senate plans, and they are very similar. On the Senate side, um, the Navajo Nation, all of the Pueblos, um, the Apache Nations were able to come to some agreement around a Senate plan. Um, on the House side, those uh, discussions are still ongoing, but um, it's a it's a pretty historic occasion when you consider that 23 tribal nations have weighed in and are supporting a plan that redraws boundaries for these political districts, redraws them in a way that um, aligns with the values of our tribal communities. So um, while we didn't get the house map agreed to yet, and there isn't consensus yet, we do have a, um, a pretty good track record so far with the Senate plan. And help me understand how different this process is from the way it was 10 years ago. Well, my understanding is from uh, 2011, the process was um, nearly entirely done in the legislative session, in a special session. And um, it was done with legislators and with research and polling um, with a lot less public input. And so this time around, we've had a number of CRC meetings across the state We've had tribal communities weigh in, tribal leaders working with indigenous communities, community, community groups working across the state. And so it's really allowed the public to weigh in in a way that they haven't been able to before. And they've been able to do that with Districter, which is the new online platform that allows anybody to draw maps, even from their phone. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, Mason, you are doing this for the first time ever, and your group submitted some maps uh, for the House districts in particular. How has this experience been for you and the members um, of your of the all the different groups that come together for the collaborative? One of this experience has been really eye opening um, and challenging uh, because the process before was typically behind closed doors. And because of the nature of New Mexico's tricultural narrative that historically excludes African-American populations, it was kind of difficult for us to figure out exactly where to start. Um, luckily, we knew some great organizations that were already doing the work um, that were able to kind of fill us in about how redistricting is going to work this time around for the Citizens Redistricting Committee. And then the other part of it was getting the African-American communities to be involved. Um, typically, we're not that involved in matters when it comes to government, when it comes to legislature, uh, because a lot of the conversations that are being had there 
don't normally include us. So it was really important for us to make sure that we did have a voice in this process to let them know that we want to be included, especially on something as important as redistricting that can affect how our uh, residents are represented for the next 10 years. One of the terms we're hearing a lot about during this process is communities of interest. And in some ways, it's easy to see that when you're talking about a Pueblo, it's got a very, you know, discrete border, and you've got a majority of people there in of the same group speak historically the same language, have a shared history and culture. But for New Mexico's Black and African American residents, this is a little bit different. What does that look like for you? So what it looks like is because the African-American community in New Mexico isn't tied to any one geographic location, um, it's much more difficult to identify exactly where those people are and what kind of power they have in a particular district. If you go to New York, you know that you're going to find African-Americans in the Bronx. If you go to Chicago, you know you're going to find African-Americans on the South Side. But here in New Mexico, because we do have smaller populations that reside in just a few areas of the state, there isn't really an opportunity for large impacts, but on those areas where they do reside, uh, we can make sure that they're represented uh, equally and accurately. And that was kind of our, our biggest challenge. You said, you know, that you historically haven't been a part of this. You historically haven't been, you know, consulted. And, and this is your first time digging into it. Something that only comes around every 10 years is pretty hard to track, but how did you think the uh, committee took your suggestions? Do you feel like they took your input um, into consideration? Did they include it? Absolutely. So I think the committee, first of all, was an amazing group of people that were all really dedicated to making sure that all ethnicities, all marginalized groups were represented fairly. Um, the Chief Justice uh, Edward Chavez and I had some conversations and he was very involved in making sure that we were submitting maps the right way, that we were creating comments and proposals the right way. And, you know, we got some great uh, recommendations on exactly where we can focus our efforts so they have the biggest impact. So because we're one of a few states that have an independent uh, citizen redistricting committee, um, this was really a great opportunity for us to make sure that the African-American community did get involved. And I think the Citizens Redistricting Committee members did an excellent job of uh, hearing our requests. And when we were able to work with some other organizations as well, they were constantly coming back to us uh, based off the proposals that we made and asking if this was um, in line with some of our recommendations. And it was really bigger than just the recommendations that were coming from the African-American community. And it was kind of like the big, bigger New Mexico uh, ethnic community coming together to, to see this through. Keegan, you know, I talked to the vice chair of the Republican Party recently, and I asked him, you know, there's a bunch of these groups we think of as constituent part, you know, parts of the Democratic Party um, who have been giving information to the committee and testifying, and they've been submitting maps. I said, I'm looking for the Republican uh, groups that are doing the same. And he said, they don't exist. Um, now the committee said that they have received a lot of input from people who identify as Republican. And the Republican party has been quite vocal. Uh, Chairman Pierce uh, called one of the uh, congressional maps, the e-golf Movida. And he thinks you know, that some of the maps that have been put forward are designed to ensure a democratic majority from here to eternity. Now, you know, it is true though that a lot of these groups do uh, represent voters who lean Democrat. Is this, you know, a strategic move on your part? You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of the voices that have been heard at the CRC meetings are coming from uh, BIPOC uh, communities and, and BIPOC-led organizations. And those organizations are going out there and talking about what is a community of interest? What does my community look like? And what are the other communities? What are my neighbors looking like? How do we naturally organize ourselves? And so a lot of times you were seeing indigenous communities talking about how they were standing side by side through generations of history 
with land grant Hispanic communities, that they don't share the same language or the same history, but they share a very common lived experience, common work, um, the use of acequias together, the use of um, the same land um, for, for similar uses. And so, um, you know, I, I think we were identifying those communities of interest and then drawing maps that reflect that. And I think um, to the Republican Party chair's point, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of times it came down to, you know, who is coming out to the meetings and what are some of the districts that they're talking about? What are the places that they want to protect for the tribe's community of interest? Not only was um, language and lifestyle and history and the reservation boundaries, but in some cases it was sacred sites. So for a lot of the Pueblos, they were talking about Chaco Canyon as a community of interest. They were talking about sacred sites and, and, and making maps that reflected that. And I think that may be one of the reasons why there people have been talking about, well, this is more um, liberal versus conservative, but um, it really isn't. It, it, I think it reflects the community coming out to speak. Keegan, we've just got a few minutes left here, a few seconds left. Um, the legislature is going to meet in December to take up these proposals. They get the final say. Are your groups going to be there to try and influence uh, their decisions? Keegan? Yes, absolutely. Uh, tribal leadership, indigenous communities will be there at the special session to continue to advocate for fair maps in our state to ensure that they reflect the wishes of indigenous communities and, and that our communities can elect the candidate of their choice. Mason, are you going to mobilize your folks to get involved in the in the in the kind of messy process as it goes through the legislature? Absolutely, uh, Echo Keegan. We will definitely be there to see this through uh, in the legislature and hopefully have um, an interaction with this process for you know the next ten years. And as we've said, that kind of interaction is going to be different from what we have seen in the past. Thank you both for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We welcome in our line opinion panel now to continue this discussion on the Citizen Redistricting Committee's work on these map proposals. With me on, on our favorite virtual roundtable this week is line regular and former House Minority Whip Daniel Foley. Also a line regular and a former lawmaker, albeit in the Senate, Didi Feldman is back with us as well. And we welcome back Serge Martinez of the UNM Law School. All right, Daniel, let me start with you. The committee has spent weeks working on these maps, gathering public input. They had a lot to consider in that process, but I'm curious, how do you think, overall, how do you think they did based on the maps they will present to lawmakers sometime in December? What's your overall take on this? Yeah, I think as Ben Lujan used to say, arguing with me was an exercise in fertility. I think watching these, this committee meets an exercise in fertility. The legislators are gonna do what the legislators do, which is always number one, protect themselves, always always 100 mm -hmm. i am always skeptical when a map comes out and you see people like michael sanchez who i think is very good at redistricting he knew what he knows what he's doing he's very good when he's overjoyed about the, the the design of a map it would be just as questionable as me being overjoyed about the design of a map right we're not we're not citizens that don't have a vested interest in the outcome of it so how does you know, that, how does I, that how does that get balanced, Daniel? I mean, you know, we know that, that legislators could just ignore this completely, but this has been a fairly public process. The public's kind of up on this. You really think that's going to happen this time around? 100%. 100%. There'll be, there'll be snippets of the, that they take out of it. Um, but, you know, now, when I say that, I also say there was some hesitancy because this is the first time in three or four decades that there hasn't been a split in redistricting between the executive and the legislative branch. That's sort of acted as a balance to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. um, so regardless of which party's in charge, you know, Texas, all the Republicans in charge, New Mexico, all the Democrats in charge, clearly you're going to see an agenda advanced by whoever has the unfettered access to getting their agenda passed. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. You always have the fly in the ointments, right? You got State Senator uh, Candelaria, who says he's retiring and is interesting calling the map committee full of a bunch of elitists. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's, he's kind of as progressive as they come uh, on the progressive side, right? You know, normally these, these bickering starts and it's always somebody you can say, well, mm -hmm. Tim Jennings is a conservative Democrat. There's nobody that claims Jacob Candelaria is a conservative Democrat. So it's going to be interesting. I think they're going to get what they want 
close to what they want out of this committee. Mm -hmm. And then more importantly, I think the tinkering that'll be done behind the scenes will definitely favor the party in charge as it should, because elections have consequences and they're in charge. Right, the sad part is let me, Republicans gotta, are going to be a minority for the next 20 years. I got to swing the others in here real quick. Didi, um, interesting, the U.S. congressional maps are largely intact. Another one to emphasize increasing Hispanic representation in CD3. And I'm, I'm wondering if you think that was a prudent approach or does that wide range of options just give lawmakers, as Dan's saying, carte blanche to make their own revisions here? Well, <clears throat> one of the most important decisions that the Citizens Redic Redistricting Commission made is that they were going to present three maps mm -hmm. for each of the um, each of the um, races that they were uh, redistricting. So that gives the legislature some leeway. And um, I think that, it, you know, I, this has been a new process and uh, I've watched them, especially the last two uh, determinati determinative um, meetings. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the voices of the participants, there's been more public participation than ever before. Hmm. They have had uh, over a thousand people uh, give input. Some of them drew maps themselves. Uh, it was quite evident to me that this commission made, uh, made a big effort to uh, accommodate public input in the maps themselves mm -hmm. and uh, to listen in this majority minority state to the voices especially of um, Native Americans and the Navajos uh, so that the, there would be a fewer voting rights uh, questions uh, when, the, uh, when the map, as it eventually will be, will be contested and uh, thrown into court. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I think that's uh, been really apparent. Interesting stuff. I got uh, some more stuff for you here, Didi, in a second. Uh, Serge, Interesting, of the three map choices, congressional map choices I'm looking at here, there was concept A, concept E, and concept H. And concept E is the one that would make Albuquerque South Valley into the state's southern district, grouping it with the district down south. It's a fascinating idea, and, and you know, it works out well in the population balance as you see it on the maps. But it's interesting, how, how would that actually function having that district poke way up almost to five points in Albuquerque mm -hmm. and down, just this little sliver. Can you see that working? Well, I mean, you're always with, you know, this huge state with three districts, it's always going to be huge, um, you know, distances between people who are still in the same constituency. And, you know, any, just about any drawing is going to have that. Any uh, redistricting is going to have that by necessity. I do think, you know, I've heard since I've, lived here the people of the south valley saying we don't we feel ignored by the rest of by albuquerque we feel like you know our interests aren't heard that it's mm -hmm. somehow functionally different um than a lot of what happens in the rest of albuquerque but Serge, so let, me, let, me, let me ask let me ask you this Serge. i mean feeling left out is one thing and one way not to solve that is be in a district with a center of gravity is going to be around las cruces i mean talk about being <laughs> Hobbs, Roswell, or Hobbs, Charles, right man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they if the oh, South Valley feels disconnected God. now, how would they? I, I just uh, anyway keep going. My fault. I'm going to cut you off there. <laughs> so no, long ago. no, I mean, look, I mean, you're 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 highlighting one of the really central issues. This like we, we it's you're supposed to not divide up, you know, communities of interest, but there's so many different ways to slice that, and mm -hmm. what that means is every single person is going to have their own interpretation of that, right? And you know, Dan was talking about the uh, Jacob. Uh, Candelaria, he was quoted as saying, look, I have a pretty good idea about what the communities of interest are. Well, guess what? So does every single person in the legislature, every person walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, this is an impossible task to make any, even two people happy, I suspect, right? Let mm -hmm. alone everybody happy about this. But um, I think it's a mistake to cut off the South Valley from Albuquerque. It's probably got more in common with, with uh, more, more, you know, in touch with Albuquerque than the rest of the state. But I like the idea, of, you know, just because we've been doing something one way in the past doesn't mean it's the way we should keep doing it. I like Fair enough. the sort of Fair innovation enough. that was applied to some of these redistricting. Yeah. Senator, Senator, your thoughts on the South Valley uh, leaving the Albuquerque Metro and being represented by uh, CD2? 
Well, you know, it all depends upon how you define community of interest. Mm -hmm. There are many different ways to define that. You can define that as an agricultural uh, community of interest, mm -hmm. a cultural community of interest, an ethnic community of interest. And this idea of um, including the agricultural South Valley of Albuquerque in a Southern district is not new. Mm -hmm. uh, it's come up um, t twice before uh, in 2010 and in 2000 uh, of uniting that uh, with uh, the Southern district to create a majority Hispanic district mm -hmm. um, that would have a more rural agricultural feel. Um, I don't think Roswell is actually in that district, Dan. I think that's actually, and this is another another uh, problem, really, that, that Roswell is actually connected with the rest of Albuquerque uh, in, in that particular map. So um, it's, mm -hmm. it's how you define community of interest, and um, I, there was mm -hmm. a lot of discussion on that. There was, absolutely. Hey, Dan, quick last question. We just said, I think I know where you're going here on this one. Are we headed back to the courts? Well, all this, if lawmakers do go rogue here, as, as you're suggesting, and the follow-up, if that does happen, won't the judge just refer back to the, the committee's maps? Yeah, I, I think the problem you're going to have, uh, so first of all, I think there'll definitely be a lawsuit no matter what, because as Serge said, you know, you're going to have two people in a room. One's not going to be happy. Yeah. Um, so someone's going to wind up going to court. I, what's going to be interesting to see is in the past, the lawsuits have always been started by either the executive against the legislative or the legislative against the executive. People that have a, an impact in writing the law. Mm -hmm. Now I think you're going to see a battle between who has standing to bring a challenge from outside, because normally in the past, it's always been a group of legislators suing somebody, they get joined by special interest groups. I think you may wind up seeing, you know, you may wind up seeing the legislature and the governor on the same page, but outside special interest groups angry uh, and trying to figure out a way to bring that case and get someone to represent it and, and argue it. That's, I think, is going to be an interesting discussion for the courts to have. Good stuff. Interesting last point there. That'll do it for redistricting for now. Still ahead on the line, the chorus grows louder from those criticizing the governor for how she's handled the spending of federal COVID relief funds. On November 2nd, voters in Albuquerque will decide on a $50 million proposal to partially fund a new stadium for the increasingly popular New Mexico United soccer team. Despite that popularity, the stadium has become a polarizing issue. Much of that has to do not with the potential economic impact, but the possible locations. The city commissioned a feasibility report, which identified two preferred locations on either side of the downtown rail yard. One is the South Broadway neighborhood. It would stretch from the southwest corner of Cole and Broadway, west to the railroad tracks and south to Santa Fe Avenue. The second possibility is in the historic Borellis neighborhood on the other side of the rail yard, from the east corner of Second and Iron, east to the railroad tracks and south Hazeldine Avenue. There are a lot of factors at play when it comes to whether or not voters will approve this measure including a community benefits agreement that will accompany the bond measure if passed. We hit the streets this week to find out how people in both of those locations feel about the possibility of such a major change right outside their door. What? Now, my, first, my first response was that, what? And no, it's not gonna be here. Initially, we were a little upset to sort of find it out because it was sort of an accidental process that helped us to discover that the plan was to put it in, you know, one of four preferred spots. We would have preferred to have been part of that conversation all along. It really felt like a slap in the face. Dad's gas station was there and there was a little store there. There were stores everywhere because I'm the president of the South Broadway Neighborhood Association. Uh, but I'm also a resident, a lifelong resident of South Broadway. St. Francis Catholic School. That was a big one, and yeah. they closed that. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of changes, and, and uh, I stayed when a lot of people left South Broadway for different reasons. After my dad died, she bought the house we're in for $1,500, and it was a mess. Oh my God. It was a mess, and my my family hated it, but I liked it. Yeah, it's a complicated history of trauma, uh, lots and lots of displacement and um, people who've been hurt by 
government and um, the kinds of urban renewal projects that meant to help people but ended up hurting people. Affordable housing is one of the most important things that we would pursue for this uh, because not only would it give people a place to live, but it would have our community be a much more vital place. I think we are already extremely special and we need to preserve all the things that make us special and these neighborhoods are definitely the soul of that, the heart of Albuquerque. What was put in the bond measure was sort of a skeleton, it's a placeholder that um, you know, names a few sort of items that we'd like to see. The CBA is a community benefits agreement uh, that a community can negotiate with the city and United the private interests. To have that on the front side of a bond instead of after the fact, and that gives us a lot of leverage uh, to make what we want out of this community benefits agreement. If this bond resolution does go through, then we would have a series of meetings in which members of the community could come and make their wishes known. Things like um, having a living wage for the employees who uh, would be working there year round, child care for people who work there, things like um, a funding stream to administer the CBA and the ongoing process because it's a kind of process that if it doesn't um, get sort of taken care of by community, it can fall by the wayside. It's really important that to us that our, our neighbors, whether they're housed or unhoused, have their needs addressed. So really, what we're looking at is an extended process of asking, what does the community want to see out of this kind of a, an agreement? We're going to have more traffic than we have on Broadway. We're going to have more noises than we're used to. We're trying our best to make sure that we plan on the front side for things like that by having parking infrastructure uh, needs be addressed as part of the CBA. I don't know where people get the idea that this is a savior for Albuquerque. It is not. It is not. It's a Trojan horse. That's all it is. And it doesn't benefit South Broadway. And in my opinion, it doesn't benefit Borales. But Borales, that's their opinion and they have a right to make their own decision. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna criticize them for it. I'm excited about the prospect of some of these things that we could bring into our community because I think Barelas really needs some of the economic vitality that this could bring to our area. I think that the most important thing to reiterate in this whole process is that we've had a success no matter whether the bond issue passes or not, um, in that we've had the city look at uh, a newly equitable framework for having these projects uh, developed in communities going forward. As you can see, there's quite a bit of nuance in this discussion, as well as some serious hand-wringing, and that includes news just yesterday. That wording for the issue on the ballot has inconsistencies, right? The measure proposes using gross receipts tax revenue bond money to pay for the project, but then later refers to them as general obligation bonds. All right, the general consensus is this was just an administrative error as these kinds of projects are usually funded through the GO bonds. But Senator Feldman, does this just sort of reinforce one of the arguments that we've heard here that this whole project has been rushed through the process just a little too much? Well, I think this was a, a mistake on the part of the county mm -hmm. who's in charge of the ballots, uh, not the city. Uh, and the, the council and the mayor have been very clear that they don't have to put this uh, measure up to the voters, but they are doing it mm -hmm. uh, because they want to. And they want to uh, get public support and see what the level of public support is. Um, and they're, and they're going to find out, uh, I think, pretty quickly. Uh, so, you know, that, that I don't think that's going to have much of a, an effect there. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be only conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. who think that this is somehow, you know, designed to influence it one way or another. Mm -hmm. Hey, Serge, as we all know, there's a major PR push from the city and the team to try and build support, as you might imagine. But did they not do their homework enough going into this to avoid some of the criticism and pushback that just seemed fairly avoidable? 
Oh my goodness. I, I mean, you don't ever want to pick a fight that you don't know you're going to win. And I've been, I've been astonished at seeing the, you know, the, the numbers of people who don't, who don't support this and the, you know, despite all of the stuff that's been showing up in my mailbox, I don't know that that's moved the needle mm -hmm. much one way or another. And the sort of the vagueness with which some of this is discussed, um, you know, if we win, there'll be a community benefit agreement, but we don't even, we're not going to say what that looks like, who's going to be at the table, you know, right. how that's going to be approved or enforced. This is just, yeah, this is someone said, oh, I have this great idea. And then everyone said, yes, let's, let's, let's do this as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a terrible idea mm -hmm. uh, to start with, but the, you know, the rollout to me has been, it seems like, like I said, lots and lots of money has been thrown at this without a whole lot of understanding of what people are going to respond to. Mm -hmm. And to, I mean, I've been pleased to see that there's a whole lot of resistance to this from the people of Albuquerque. Um, Daniel, if you know, when you think of, when you think about another reason for opposition on this issue is trust or a lack thereof. Many of the communities you hear the feedback feel they've been ignored for years or even decades, they're not exactly thrilled with being the reason they're finally being listened to now. You know, how can a state and its leaders go about regaining, you know, trust during this process? Well, well, I, I think it's funny. I, I, you know, I love Dee Dee and Dee Dee and I have a great relationship. I love when she says, the mayor didn't have to do this. They're doing it just to find out. No, they're doing it because they'd have gotten their teeth kicked in if they didn't try to go to the voters for it. And uh, I think they may be regretting going to the voters for it. You know, whenever you see the folks that live in Bad Ellis supporting it on the same side as the Rio Grande Foundation, that's a real question about if you're on the right side of the issue. I, I think, you know, the thing that's, there's just been a lot of uh, Serge touched on this. There's been a lot of, and Didi's talked about this. There's been a lot of questions raised, and then there's been a lot of, "Don't worry about it. We'll take care of you guys when it's done." Right. And I just don't think the people in New Mexico are believers of that, especially in the areas where they're talking about putting this. I mean, you know, they they say, "Hey, we're going to have these three, four, three or four areas." Nobody's ever told you where the final area is yet. They have said that they have eliminated one of them, but they're not sure which of the other two, mm -hmm. which just makes everybody else on the outside say, all that means is the people that have the money haven't bought up all the property yet. That's why they're not telling anybody where it is. So so I, I think that this thing is, is, is wrought with problems. It didn't help to have that you know, COVID come along, teachers quitting, hospital workers, pol you know, the problems with the Albuquerque Police Department and the Sheriff's Department that we're having. And now everybody's out saying well, that $50 million could sure, even though it wouldn't be used for that, that's not the public's perception, right? That's the public's right. perception is you're wasting 50 million. Good and point. so at the end of the day, you know, I've always said, look, I'm not opposed to, I, first of all, I think they should be congratulated for going to the voters. Dee Dee's right. They didn't have to go to the voters. And and I think that whenever they go to the voters, I've always been an advocate saying, let the voters let the voters speak. I'm just surprised that there's not a communication with the University of New Mexico to try to figure out how to cut that number grossly in half, fix the soccer stadium up there. You got all the infrastructure, all the parking, everything's there. Yeah, but every, everyone's got a reason everyone's got a reason not to do that. And everyone's hung up I on agree. the fact this has to be a brand new stadium which is oh, I, going to be the most expensive stadium in the league, by the way, <laughs> right here in Albuquerque. One road in and one road out, right? Thanks, You're going to go up you. and down 2nd Street to get in. You're going to display. The other thing is, the other thing, which, you know, we've heard Hang this on, Dana, I got right? to get uh, Serge here. Let me, let me hold you, your thought on that. Serge, you know, the news came out that the United team is spending a whole lot of PR money with a lot of firms out of state. And this didn't sit too well with a lot of people here because you have this team talking about New Mexico this, New Mexico that. Albuquerque this, Albuquerque that. But meanwhile, 300 grand plus went out the door to Ohio for TV commercials and stuff for the team. Does that stuff mean anything to people? Is it, is it important or how should we take that? No, I think, it, I think it's very important to, you know, to, to, you know, not, this has just been tone deaf from the start and this is tone deafer. Right to do that, and people, you know, that money has been coming back. Like I said, in my mailbox, I'm getting something two or three times a day. Um, uh, so that's, you know, I've been paying. We've been they've been paying someone in Ohio to send that money to me rather than someone local. And I think, you know, to say, yeah, we're New Mexico United, and you know, all of the things about how this is the state's team, and to then spend all that money out of state is, I mean, it's maybe more revealing than anything else, and makes me question significantly the sincerity of 
of this, you know, retroactively, in fact, mm. uh, about sort of the the United, the New Mexico United message that they've been trying to. You know, and it to... comes on the heels that late in the game, suddenly they found $10 million they could have mentioned, you know, early in the process here. Yeah. Um, meaning the owners of the team. Uh, Senator, Mayor Keller has been a vocal supporter of the bond proposal, as we all know, although he said he will respect whatever decision voters make. And so the question that I got to ask is, is aligning himself with the stadium deal, is it one or the other? Is he going to, if he gets reelected, did he lose a stadium? Does he lose both? Does this hurt his chances at the poll? You know, how does this all sort of intersect to you? <laughs> Well, first of all, I have to give a disclaimer, and that is that I'm a, I'm a supporter of this stadium. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, to answer your question, um, I don't think there's a perfect alignment there. I think that the mayor is doing this because he believes in it. And uh, he believes that we need to take a leap to change our uh, downtown and our community. And I why, think what you heard here let me, let me ask you something. Is, Senator, why not just pour $25 million into downtown and fix it? Why does it need a stadium? Because you need an anchor. Because you need an anchor. Uh, imagine what a downtown would have been like if 25 years ago we had invested in a festival marketplace or during the term of Jim Baca if we had put the Isotope Stadium downtown recall it rather well. than mm -hmm. where it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's part of a package and uh, it's, uh, you know, people people distrust this kind of investment, but until we're willing to make that kind of investment, uh, we're not going to go very far uh, so, downtown. So, Gene, I, I think in a disclaimer, I'm a season ticket holder mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I try to support the organizations. I think we do have an anchor tenant downtown right now. It's called crime. And I think until they figure out a way to address that, um, you know, my office is downtown. I'm downtown every single day. I see and it. it's getting yeah. it's getting more and more unsafe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we not to go off on a tangent, talking about the mental health and the stuff we've talked about ad nauseum on here. I, I think that it's just that people don't see it now. Uh, my prediction is, is that the mayor is tying himself to this, which is not a bad idea. Right. He's looking like a guy who's letting the people make a choice. Give 20, a voice. 20 seconds, if you would give a voice. If this thing loses, I wouldn't be surprised to see either federal dollars or state dollars come in to try to make this happen, uh, even if the if the voters say they don't want it to happen. Mm -hmm. The last thing I would say is all the people are going to be displaced from down there. What are we going to do with them? You can't find an apartment to rent in New Mexico right That's now. Right. You can't find a house to buy for under three or four hundred thousand dollars. And I just think it's I just think it's a tough time to be making a decision like this. We're going to continue to bring you new context on this issue leading up to Election Day on November 2nd. Next week, we'll hear from city councilors with their perspective on the bond proposal. New Mexico author William Dubois is back on bookstore shelves with another new offering. The Trail to Kanjaroba takes us on his journey with a medical expedition in Nepal. Along the way, he explores ideas of earth care and what that means in a time of climate change and species extinctions. This week, he joins correspondent Laura Paskus to talk about his book and his hopes for the future. Bill DeBuiz, thank you so much for joining me to talk about your new book, um, in which you explore some of the ideas of earth care and this notion of um, not trying to save the earth, but care for it. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited about this conversation today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Laura, as always. So you joined a medical team, trekking to remote villages in Nepal, and along the way you're seeing signs of change, including climate change. And you seem to be mulling this idea of hospice care for the earth. What does that mean? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, the, the values of the medical team I was accompanying uh, were the values of very fundamental medicine. We didn't have access to x-rays or scans or blood work, let alone surgery. And so the service delivered was very direct. It was care over cure. It was warm hand to warm hand. And I wondered, going into the trek, whether those values of caring more than fixing would be good values to apply to earth care. Uh, this book is really the third book in a trilogy 
Uh, the first book, A Great Aridness, is on climate change. The second, The Last Unicorn, looks into the terrible situation of wildlife and the loss of biodiversity. And after doing those two books, I was kind of heartsick, and I was looking for a way to be able to look at the facts of these dire situations directly and not lose heart, not be dis too discouraged, not become numb or cynical or even just shut down, but stay committed, not lose heart. So this book is about my journey trying to find a way not to lose heart, but to sort of gain heart and recommit to the work that needs to be done. You wrote in the book, let's be real, we don't live in the gentle Holocene anymore. And no doubt this summer especially is proving that. And throughout the book you grapple with this idea when it comes to climate change. And eventually in the book you write, to trust in the uncertainty of the future, believing in the possibility, however remote of beneficial change, that is the essence of hope. And I feel like for me personally, this idea of hope, it kind of throws me off sometimes because I don't know if it's a slogan, if it's kind of an insincere promise, if it prevents me from maybe doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, and so I loved your writing about hope in this book. And I'm curious, why is uncertainty of not knowing what might happen such an important part of hope? That's that's the heart of it in a way. As you say, hope is a really complicated concept. It, it means different peop things to different people. And often for a lot of people, it just means, will this worry go away? You know, will things go back to the nice way they used to be? And, and you know, that's out, out of the picture for us today. But the kind of hope that relies on endurance, on being open and prepared for things to turn in a positive way, for beneficial surprise, that's the kind of hope that's going to get us through the dilemmas we're in now. And, and in a way, uh, this quest of mine was looking for not just an intellectual hope, but a hope in here. Uh, a hope that seeps into uh, your whole being. You mentioned beneficial surprise. Are there any examples of those out there in the world right now or that we might look forward to when we're thinking about climate change? Well, specifically about climate change, I don't know. All the, all the data looks pretty negative. Um, the big beneficial change that I mention in the book actually is that of the collapse of the Soviet Union. The CIA didn't see it coming. Nobody saw it coming. It, and when it came, it came really fast. And some leaders like Vaclav Havel, who is one of my heroes, were ready for it because he had the right kind of hope to, to respond to that surprise uh, as positively as possible and make something really good out of it, which was the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. So I appreciated reading this book for lots of reasons, the hope, um, lots of reasons. But in particular, um, not having left New Mexico since before the pandemic started, I needed to go on this journey with you through the Himalayas. Um, but you've lived in New Mexico for four decades now. What were some of the similarities that you noticed um, in the change that you're seeing, included, including climate change? in the Himalayas and here in northern New Mexico? Well, on, this, uh, on these journeys, we were mostly above timberline. But when we were below timberline, the forests were so similar. Uh, the, the pine that's in Nepal, up to about 11,000 feet or so, is a pine very like a ponderosa pine, another three-needle pine. And it was interesting to me to see that those trees had the same health problems that our trees, I mean, the, the forest dynamics of, of drying, of too much heat, of insect outbreaks, all those things seem to be happening there in exactly the same kind of pattern that we have here. So, and, 
and it was a mountain world. I live, as you know, an hour north of Santa Fe, up in one of the small uh, villages of northern New Mexico. And the village life there and the village life in, in uh, Himalayan Nepal is not all that different. So one of the ideas that you write about in The Last Unicorn, and it comes up again in your new book, that has really stuck with me over the years is this idea that we share this planet with all of these different species and we're just this little planet in a vast universe and every time we allow a species to go extinct our planet becomes a little lonelier and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that idea and and how that idea evolved in you well, you know, one of the inspiring teachers on this subject for me is a New Mexico a Pueblo Indian uh, scholar, Rena Swensel um, from Santa Clara Pueblo. One of my favorite mini chapters in the book is really, well, it's titled Rena. And it's, I quote her as saying, and I'll, I'll get the quote a little bit wrong here, but um, She's saying our, our world as humans has just become too small. It's just us. We're only thinking about us and not about the whole community of life through which flows the, the water wind breath, which in her telling sounds an awful lot like the, the Tao of ancient China. Um, so she would say, she's, she's gone now, alas, but she would say that our invention of anthropomorphic gods made us too arrogant, made us seeing the world too narrowly, and we forget about the whole creation of which we are a part, which is really the most glorious thing about our life on this planet, is the connectedness of all those things. So like you mentioned, this book is the third in a trilogy, A Great Airedness, The Last Unicorn. A Great Airedness came out in 2011. I'm curious how your writing has changed, how, how you bear witness now compared with back in 2011. Golly, that's a question I've never thought about, what I want from the reader. I think one of the things that's changed for me is just to be more confident that I don't have to organize things ahead of time. I don't have to prepare as much. I can go into a trip or a writing effort and just figure it out as I go along. And I think what I most want from a reader is just an openness to take the journey with me, to, uh, to, to just see what happens as well. I think this is a book that has a number of surprising turns and, and surprises in it. And if you stay with it a little bit, I think the rewards are there. But um, there's a certain amount of uh, establishing uh, matters, a certain amount of exposition that uh, is required for the best part to make all the sense that it can. And I think in this book, I, the, the, the end resisted me for a long, long time. But, it, but finally now, I feel the end is the best part of the whole book. Well, I was very happy to go on that journey with you, and I'm sure our viewers will be, too. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for joining me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Laura. The state's top economic authority is siding with state lawmakers, questioning whether the governor has the power to unilaterally allocate federal COVID-19 relief money. New Mexico Treasurer Tim Eichenberg says the state's constitution requires input from the legislature. On the other hand, the governor's office is pointing to pass legal precedent. It says supports Governor Lujan Grisham's approach so far. A bipartisan lawsuit is pending in the state Supreme Court. While we wait for progress there, let's turn our, to our line opinion panel for their take. Now, as someone who's been in these sorts of power struggles before, Serge, is there any way to get this cleared up before the court makes a decision? <laughs> you know, um... They're having arguments uh, in a few weeks on this. I mm -hmm. think that's not enough time for, for folks to, to reach any sort of agreement. It would require sort of the sort of thing that New Mexico is 
not great at mm -hmm. um, getting everybody to sit down and talk about this and figure something out. Um, so I'm not super optimistic that this gets resolved anywhere but at the Supreme Court, which is you know the exact worst place to resolve these to have these sorts of things decided uh, in the courts and not with the people involved. But you know I think the legal arguments I've sort of I'm set a little bit familiar with them on both sides and I can't say which way the court is going to come down on this, but I am as I see this, right, some of this is a function of, or to me reflects the, the the issue that we have in New Mexico of our legislature doesn't meet hardly ever. And, you know, it's always this huge lift to get everyone together to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, whatever the constitutional question is, answer is, there's also the practical question of how this money gets allocated and spent. And New Mexico is just poorly designed for something of like this, a big chunk of money that needs to get out quickly and should be getting out quickly and how it's to be done. Right. We've shot ourselves in the foot a little bit with our legislative structure here. Interesting point. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator, we all know in the legislature, the legislature holds the purse strings in government. <clears throat> uh, does a public health emergency trump that? Or would the governor have been better served to just bring lawmakers in on the discussion from the get go? You know, it, 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 was that the better way to go? I think both of your statements are true. Uh, the governor would have been better off by bringing the uh, legislators in from the very beginning, starting uh, with this in January or mm -hmm. even before, to talk about what are the major crises that need to be addressed during this uh, public health emergency. Bill Richardson did something like that uh, when ARA funding or Recovery Act funding was available. Uh -huh. Uh, he, he actually uh, appointed a commission and went around the state uh, and got a lot more public input into it than this governor has uh, and vetted a lot of the stuff with the chair of that committee and the legislature. Hmm. But yes, I do think that a public health emergency trumps um, the power of the legislature to be, to be appropriating federal funds which I think is questionable anyway on legal grounds. But, um, uh, you know, she has been successful in getting money out the door quickly. Just yesterday we read about uh, the money that, that, that New Mexico and Albuquerque met the federal deadline for housing funds. Right. Today there was another article about how money is going out the door for child care. Mm -hmm. um, I think consultation does, uh, does uh, slow down that process and we are in a public health emergency. Mm -hmm. Dan, speaking of which, the governor has um, extended the indoor mask mandate into at least November 12th. And the state, you know, has moved into back into a crisis standard of care model. We've talked about a lot in the show to help make them. Uh, all right. To help make difficult decisions about health care as the entire system is pushed to the brink. Have we had we haven't had those since December of last year. These things they are talking about. So are these prudent moves by the governor on her part, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the governor's going to do what the governor does. I, I think that it's, you know, I'm not necessarily on board with a lot of the decisions on the on the whole pandemic deal. I think what people are getting upset with is there is as much of a frustration about our lack of health care workers mm -hmm. as there is filling the beds. And I think that what people are starting to see is it's not that beds are full or hospitals are full. It's that the amount of beds that are eligible for the percentage of workers that are there are full. And I think that's the frustrating part for people. So, you know, the interesting part back to what you were asking Dee, Dee and Serge, Gene, mm -hmm. is, you know, the consultative part. It's interesting to see that a Democrat governor with a Democrat controlled legislature is they, they weren't capable to come up with a plan to do this. Uh, and get, you know, and figure out a way to do this. Normally it's a Republican governor, Democrat legislature at odds at what they're going to, what they're going to do. And that's where the fighting starts. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, and I know Serge would never say this, he won't even laugh because he's a, he's a great lawyer and very well respected. I can tell you how the Supreme Court's going to decide this. They're going to look at the people that are angry and they're going to say, who's going to be around longer deciding our funding. And that's going to be the side that actually wins. So I think it's going to be another victory for the legislature because they're going to look around and go, well, well, you know, Governor Max, four years. Some of these guys that are complaining going to be here 10, 15 more years. We're going to side with those guys. Interesting. You know how this game works. Interesting. Hey, Serge, uh, Interim Health Secretary, uh, Secretary Scrace this week expressed his ongoing concern about the burden 
on our healthcare systems and especially workers we just talked about with Dan. Are you worried about the long lasting impacts of this pandemic as this crisis lingers on and on on New Mexico? I mean, of course I am, right? This is, this is un unbelievable how long this has gone on, right? I know the governor has extended her emergency order 22 times as I understand it, because we all keep thinking, oh, just any minute now this is gonna end. But there's no way this doesn't have a huge long-term effect and doesn't call, you know, cause everybody to revisit what their job is, what they want to do, what you know, how they want to live their lives, and where they want to spend their time. Their their time, mm -hmm. and, and the uncertainty of all this only heightens that. Which you know, that's not a, necessarily a bad thing that people are re rethinking what's going on in their lives. But this is obviously going to be the defining event for for so many things, but especially you know our health system as we look back and think, what are all the ways this went wrong? How could we possibly mm -hmm. deal with something going on in the future? And the individuals who are gonna be involved and in what we expect from them. So mm -hmm. I'm glad people are thinking about this now. Obviously it's distressing that it's taken this extended public health crisis to bring us to this point. It, we Dan, if you go to the go state health department website and look at the number of beds that are available in New Mexico, and then look at the numbers of people that are filling them with COVID, there is a huge discrepancy between the number of beds that are that they say physically are available versus the number of people. The problem is the healthcare worker. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is that as I'm sitting here talking to you guys from my office, I'm looking at this great expansion that Presbyterian is doing right down the street, mm -hmm. UNMH is doing. Mm -hmm. There's unbelievable building going on in this state for hospitals, especially in the metro area. And yet we can't find people to work in them. And no one seems to want to address that problem. I think it's the old, you know, it's the old, uh, uh, adage from the movie, if you build it, they will come. I think the plan is if you build this space, people are going to come work here, but I'm not sure we're going to get the healthcare workers to fill the spaces so the patients can get the, the care they need. Last word there. That's all, the, that's all for the line this week. We thank you all for your thoughtful comments as always, and be sure to keep up with the show each week on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube channels. I want to thank County Clerk Linda Stover for carving out some time for us earlier this week on our Wednesday noon Facebook Live discussion on the hows and where one exercises their right to vote. I got to thinking about how many countries around the world would be shocked at the ease and openness of our system. By any measure, when you look at our system, it just couldn't be easier to register and vote. And if you watch the Mexico in Focus, there's no end to issues needing your voice right now. So go sign up. We'll see you on November 2nd. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.